Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon from Clinic Reviews, the very best NCLEX review out there, in my opinion. You can go to Clinic Reviews to find the online on-demand program. I do the reviews out in California. I haven't scheduled another one yet, but uh, at some point I will be. So if you're interested in seeing me out in California, keep your eye out uh, at Clinic Reviews to see when I'm going to be going out there again. Thank you to all of our channel members. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video. It does help get it out there. We've got over 60,000 subscribers now to the channel. And if you think this is helpful, if it's been helpful to you, go ahead and like the video. So I do not want to bury the lead. So today we're going to be talking about pediatrics growth and development. It's the last pediatrics video for a while. And I thought a long time about what I wanted to do today. And I decided I'm doing growth and development because it's very likely you're going to get pediatric growth and development questions, or just generally you're going to get growth and development questions on the NCLEX. But the thing that I really want to focus on today is what do you do when you're not sure what the right answer is? So I'm not going to be teaching you principles today so much as I'm going to be talking about using common sense. The first 10 to 12 questions on the NCLEX is primarily common sense. So Mark has always said, look, uh, you need to just use common sense for the first 10 questions. That is what's going to happen is you're going to sit down and you're going to get a question. You're going, oh, my word, I don't know what the answer to this is. I did all this studying. I studied for endless hours. I spent all this money studying. And this, this is the question I get. Yes, that's the question you get because it's common sense. So what I want you to understand, first of all, is you have to use common sense when you're answering questions, particularly the first 10 to 12 questions. And number two, you cannot expect to know every answer. That is so critically important that you do not expect to know every answer on the test. So you, you can't just go, oh, I don't know, just eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Okay, there's no eeny, meeny, miny, mo on the NCLEX, y'all. No eeny, meeny, miny, mo at all. Okay, you have to use common sense. Uh, use some of the guessing strategies. Mark does small group tutoring and he does uh, guessing strategies. Uh, in some depth, it's really great tutoring, by the way, that he does. It does cost money, but if you go to Clinic Reviews, you can sign up for his um, his small group tutoring. I also do small group tutoring if you're interested in next-gen tutoring. It costs money. So. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And I want you to understand that this isn't about what do you know fact-wise. This is about general nursing knowledge and using common sense. All right, which behavior will the nurse observe in an infant who is in the active alert stage? The infant has minimal body twitches and eye movements. The infant falls back to sleep upon rocking. The infant grimaces when being spoken to or held. The infant is very sensitive to stimuli. So first of all, I want you to pay attention when they give you an age in the question, okay? The age in the question doesn't always make a difference, but usually it does, particularly when it comes to children. And so, uh, and since so much of the questions related to children is going to be growth and development, pay attention to that. So this is an infant. So an infant is in the first year of life. It's not just born. An infant is a, a newborn, is a neonate but an infant is in the first year of life. And so you might say, like I said, uh, I don't know what the active alert stage is. I have no idea what the active alert stage is, y'all. I, I told you back in the very first video that I did with peds is peds is not my strong suit. Um, I don't know a lot about peds. So I go, well, I don't know what the active alert stage is, but I know what active means. It means they're moving. And I know alert means their eyes are open. All right. So I'm going to pick an answer that shows that I know that this is a first year of life and that they're active and alert. So the infant has minimal body twitches and eye movements. Well, that doesn't make sense with the words active and alert. So because if they're active and alert, they're looking around. It's the first year of life. It's not the first day where their eyes aren't open. Right. It's the first year they're looking around and active. So I'm not picking a the infant falls back to sleep upon rocking. Well, that's not active and alert. That's sleeping. So I'm not going to pick that one. The infant grimaces when being spoken to or held. Well, that would show that they're alert, but it doesn't really seem to fit with what the question's asking. So I'll keep that as a maybe. The infant is very sensitive to stimuli. Okay, so I don't love the word very sensitive, but if they're active and alert, and uh, stimuli could be a light, right? So that means they're going to be, oh, they're sensitive to that. 
Um, it could be touch them. Oh, they noticed that. It could be a clap. Oh, I heard that. Or dog barking. Oh, I heard that. So that to me seems like active and alert, more so than grimacing when being spoken to or held. If I just think about what the words mean. So I'm going to pick the infant is very sen sensitive to stimuli, even, and that's the right answer, by the way, even though I didn't memorize this, I've never heard of the active alert stage. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. So what I'm talking, what I'm doing here, and I don't do this real often, but these are actually questions that I did not write. And I want to show you how I answered questions that I didn't know the answer to, but I had to work through them. I want you to hear my way of thinking. And I've had to practice, I've had to practice not second guessing myself because it was between C and D for me. And I was like, D makes more sense, Sharon. Do not pick C. Stop. Because I was like, oh, but it could be C. And I'm always tempted to go with the one that it could be. Well, it could be this, even though D makes more sense. So I've had to be very intentional in policing my own thoughts so that I don't pick an answer that I really didn't think was the best answer. All right. Number two, which statement is true for a chronically ill child with altered growth? So a child's not an infant. So it's a child, probably preschool or school age is what I'm thinking. So they've had, they're chronically ill and that's altered their growth. I'm assuming that's physical growth. Height and weight percentiles similar to healthy peers, late development milestones compared with peers, similar developmental milestones compared with peers, growth and development unaffected in chronically ill children. All right. So I'm going to say A is not true because it's not consistent with the question. So I don't know what growth does in chronically ill, or I'm sorry, I don't know what what's true for a chronically ill child who has altered growth. I don't know. But I have a child who's altered growth. And so A cannot be true if they have altered growth, right? Because it's that saying they're going to be the same as their peers. And that's not true. So I'm crossing off A. Late developmental milestones compared with the peers. That seems like a possibility. I mean, if they're, if they're altered growth, it seems like they could also, it, growth and development, those words growth and development always go together. So it seems like if growth is altered, development could be altered as well. So it's, B seems like a possibility. Similar developmental milestones compared with peers. Mm, I maybe could be, I mean, it, it's either late or it's similar, it's not, it's not early D growth and development unaffected in chronically ill children. Well, they already told us they had altered growth. So I cannot pick a, and I cannot pick D because those are the opposite of what the answer told me or the question said was going on. They told me it was altered growth. So I cannot pick a and D. So I have to say, well, if they have altered growth, chronically ill, would I think that altered development would be more likely or similar development? And I have to say, if they have altered growth, it makes sense using common sense that they would also have late developmental milestones because they have altered growth. And I would think they'd also have altered development. So even though I didn't know the answer to this question, if I think through it and I use my common sense, I can get the right answer. Now, I'm not telling you that you're always going to get the right answer. That is not what I'm telling you. Uh, I'm telling you, you're going to get the right answer more often than you will if you go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, right? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, probably get the right answer about 25% of the time. If you do this, you'll probably get the right answer over half the time, maybe more. All right, next question. What is the rationale behind placing a newborn in supine position while sleeping? Well, Mark has always said vocabulary is the number, number one reason people fail boards, vocabulary. So you have to know what supine means. So if you don't know what supine means, you're going to have trouble answering this question. So supine means laying on their back. So that's first. You have to know your vocabulary. So supine, why do we place infants on or newborns on their back? To prevent anencephaly in the child, to prevent unintentional injury to the child, in the, in the child, to prevent Edwards syndrome in the child, to prevent sudden infant death syndrome in the child. Well, I know that we're always supposed to place infants on their back to prevent sudden infant death syndrome. And so what you don't say is, well, that seems too easy. Maybe, maybe it, it causes Edwards syndrome. Have you ever heard of Edwards? I've never heard of Edwards syndrome, y'all. I don't know what that is. Unintentional injury. I, that, that doesn't make any sense. Crossing that off. To prevent anencephaly in the child. I don't know what that is. Can I be honest? Some of you maybe know what it is. I don't. And I didn't look it up because I don't look up things that I don't think I need to know. 
So I didn't look it up, but I do know that D is why we place babies, newborns on their back and supine is on their back. So in, a, in some ways, this question is really testing. Do you know your vocabulary and do you know a general principle about sleeping? So that is just make sure you know your vocabulary. That doesn't mean you have to know every disease. When I say vocabulary, I'm not saying every disease like anencephaly or Edwards syndrome. I'm saying typical vocabulary that's used in healthcare that you should know what it means. All right, next question. The nurse is teaching how to prevent suffocation in children to the mother of a one-year-old. Which statement should be included in the teaching? Okay, a one-year-old, one-year-old. So they're not an infant, so they don't have to sleep on their back because I do know if there was an infant, they'd have to sleep on their back to prevent sudden infant death syndrome, which I think is like suffocating. Avoid excess bedding. Use warm water for bathing the child. Keep cosmetics out of reach from the child or refrain from letting the child play near mushroom plants. All right. Well, what jumps out at me right away is avoid excess bedding, because when I think of suffocation, I think of in bed while they're sleeping. That's just the first thing that comes to my mind, because I know that's what we worry about with with infants. So this isn't an infant, but it's still that's so what comes to my mind. So I like a OK, B, use warm water for bathing the child. That just doesn't make any sense to me. If I'm using common sense, y'all doesn't make any sense. Eh, I'm crossing it off. Keep cosmetics out of the reach from the child. All right. How could cosmetics suffocate my child? I, I just, I mean, I guess unless I, I mean, I would have to go so far outside the realm of probability to figure out how cosmetics could suffocate my child. Don't say, well, they could have an allergic reaction. It doesn't say allergic reaction. It says suffocation. Those are different things. Okay. See, I, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Refrain from letting the child play near mushrooms. Well, how is that going to going to prevent suffocation? It could prevent an allergic reaction. Well, first of all, I don't know if they're allergic. Secondly, that's an allergic reaction, not suffocation. So don't go off in your head and go, oh, but it could be this, this or this. Y'all, you only know what they're telling you and you only know suffocation. And the only one that makes any sense is to avoid excess bedding. That's one of the reasons we do avoid excess bedding. That's one of the reasons we do avoid putting uh, stuffed animals in the bed and so forth. So to prevent suffocation. So even though I didn't know you should still avoid excess bedding when they're one, it's the only one that makes any sense. So use your common sense. During a home visit, the nurse observes that school aged twins are arguing over toys and talking over each other. What should the nurse document this observation? Well, these are school aged twins, school aged. They're arguing over who gets the toys and they're talking over each other. Okay. School age. The twins are experiencing social isolation. The twins are experiencing sibling rivalry. The twins are experiencing failure to thrive. The twins are experiencing separation anxiety. Well, they're together. They're together. So I'm not going to pick D. That makes no sense. I'm not picking D. And it doesn't say anything about thriving. It doesn't tell me their weight or the developmental, anything. It doesn't tell me that. There's not enough information to say failure to thrive. In fact, if they're talking and arguing, it seems like that's not failure to thrive. So I'm crossing off C. So Either they're experiencing social isolation, which in my mind, kind of, I think, well, they could be. I mean, if it's just the two of them, are they hanging out with any other kids or are they experiencing sibling rivalry? Now, which one makes the most sense without over without overthinking it, without going, well, they could, you know, I mean, it's just the two of them. Maybe they're not playing with any other kids. And so they could be experiencing social isolation. Does it say that? Does it say they only play with each other and they never play with other kids? No, that's not what it says. It says they are simply playing together and arguing and talking over each other. And that is, if you just go with the words you got, that's sibling rivalry, y'all. And we all know that. It's common sense. It's common sense. So they are, the NCLEX is testing your common sense. Do you really want to have a nurse with no common sense, y'all? You don't want that, do you? I don't want a nurse with no common sense. I mean, come on. All right, which condition can be observed in the neonate of a client who had a substance use disorder during pregnancy? A neonate, newborn. Okay, neonate is a newborn. So just after delivery, like the first month. Lysencephaly, don't know what that is. Microcephaly, that's a small head. Schizencephaly, schizencephaly, don't know what that is. Dandy Walker malformation, don't know what that is. 
The only thing I know that it is, is microcephaly. And I have a rule that I don't choose answers that I don't know what they mean unless I rule out every other answer. And I cannot rule out every other answer because I actually like microcephaly. I'm not sure that that is what happens with substance use disorder uh, after delivery, but it makes sense to me that it would, that if you alter brain development, which substance use could do, that you would have a smaller head. Like that just makes sense to me. It sounds horrible. Like that would be awful to have that happen, but it makes sense. And I don't know what any of the others mean. So I'm going to use my common sense and use the one that makes the most sense to me. So I'm going to pick microcephaly. All right, next question. While assessing the skin of a one week old newborn, the nurse finds that the newborn has rashes with red macules and papules on the trunk area. What should the nurse interpret from this finding? The infant has milia. The infant has lanugo. The infant has Epstein pearls. The infant has erythema toxica. All right, so if you watch the video, normal variations in the newborn, I'm quizzing you on whether or not you remember that video, normal variations in the newborn. But let's say you didn't watch it. And you're like, I don't remember what that is. Okay, one week old, newborn, rashes, and red macules and papules. So what, is, what does red, what is another word for red? Well, another word for red is erythema. Erythema means redness. That's what that word means. So if you want to use common sense, you go, well, they got redness and D is redness of some sort. I'm going to pick the answer that's consistent with the question because milia, pretty sure that's not milia. I, I, I can't, you know, I might say, well, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's not red. Milia isn't. Lanugo is like that stuff that's on the skin when they're first born that like is like cheesy stuff. And Epstein pearls, I may say, I don't know what that is, but pearls aren't red. And these are our red rashes. So I'm going to go with erythema toxicum. Now, if you no watch normal variations in the no newborn, you know that's what the right answer is. But what I'm telling you is you don't have to know the answer to every question. You don't have to memorize every fact that's out there. Stop trying to memorize every fact that's out there and start using your common sense. The NCLEX wants to know if you know fundamental principles and you say, well, I don't know what erythema toxicum is. Yeah, but you know what erythema means? And you know, red means erythema. Okay, so use your common sense, y'all. A primary healthcare provider prescribes a single intramuscular dose of vitamin K to a neonate. What is the correct age for administration of vitamin K to the infant? Okay, well, a neonate is a newborn. So it could be two weeks after birth, uh, six within six hours before the first breastfeeding within six months. Well, I'm going to cross off D because that doesn't make any sense. Before the first breastfeeding, I don't know of anything that has to be done before the first breastfeeding. I mean, the first breastfeeding can be done as far as, I mean, it, it, it can be done whenever, as soon as the baby's ready. And it the, the breast milk helps bolster like the immune system of the baby. So I don't see why vitamin K would have to be given. Now, if I, if I say, well, what is vitamin K for? Well, vitamin K is what we give as the antidote for Coumadin or Warfarin. It's the, it's the antidote. So if your Coumadin level is too high, your Warfarin level is too high, I can give vitamin K and it reduces your, your bleeding time, right? So it, it decreases the, the tendency to bleed out. So when would the, the baby might have issues with bleeding? Well, it just makes sense that if they have an issue with bleeding, it would be right after birth. I mean, maybe they're born with some kind of bleeding disorder. It just doesn't make sense to me to give it two weeks after birth. Like I, I've never heard of giving vitamin K to a baby two weeks after birth. Now I'll be honest with you. I've never heard of giving vitamin K to a newborn anyway, but I know what vitamin K is used for. And it makes the most sense that if they're going to have a bleeding disorder, it would be, dis and if it's congenital, it would be figured out right at the beginning when the baby's born. So I did choose that and that was the right answer. So I didn't know the answer. Now, usually I'll tell you one thing I usually do is I usually try to avoid answers that have numbers in them unless I'm sure the number is correct. However, there were three answers that had numbers in them and I didn't like the answer that didn't have a number in it. Like I didn't like before the first breastfeeding, that just didn't make any sense to me. It just didn't sound right. And Mark always says, if 
If something sounds like the right answer, it probably is just because it's the right answer. And if something doesn't sound like the right answer, it probably isn't just because it probably isn't. It just doesn't sound like the right answer. And I tend to use follow my gut with these things. What I'm, But what I'm saying is I don't second guess my gut. So I don't go, well, it didn't sound right. But, you know, maybe I was wrong, right? No, no. If my gut is saying it doesn't sound right, I go, probably doesn't sound right. And I don't second guess that. So um, I crossed off C. So I had to pick an answer that had a number in it, even though I didn't know if any of those numbers were right. So I crossed off D because I didn't. that didn't sound right to me at all. Um, and then I had to choose between A and B. And B just sounded like it made more sense to me. Just thinking through nursing, nursing process, nursing practice. When do we do these things? What do I know about vitamin K? When would the baby maybe be at risk for bleeding and so forth? So those are the things I think of. So what I what I did with this, this video is I let you hear how I think when I'm answering questions that I don't know the answer to and how I use my common sense. Now, there's some questions that it's a little, maybe a little harder to use your common sense, but you never throw it out completely. You should always have common sense as the underlying principle that you're using as well as fundamental. So you say, what is, what do I know about fundamentally about nursing, about acid base, about oxygenation, about mobility, um, about bleeding, right? Just like fundamental knowledge. And I'm not going to throw that fun. I'm not going to throw my common sense out the window. I'm not going to throw my fundamental knowledge out the window and try to make this more complicated than it needs to be. All right. Well, I don't know. I hope you liked it. I hope, I hope it was helpful. You have to let me know. I haven't done, um, I haven't done a video like this before. So if you want me to do, let me know if you want me to do more common sense questions and I will try to do that. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.